Hi, everyone. This is Raquel. Hi, and this is Jennifer. Welcome to Madness Cafe. This is a feminist podcast where we talk about women's issues, politics, and health and wellness. And where those issues intersect. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Madness Cafe. Today, Jennifer and I are joined by Katherine Hiller, who is the author of this lovely book that I'm holding here and that Jennifer is pointing to for those of you who are watching. It's called Sybil Unbound. And this is actually Catherine's sixth novel. She's also the author of two children's books, a short story collection, Skin, and the controversial Just Say Yes, a marijuana memoir. Short pieces have appeared in the New York Times, Sunday Review, AARP Magazine, I think Raquel okay. froze on us. Yeah. Oh, and no. Short places anyway. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that we'll just continue on and she'll catch back up with us. Okay. Catherine, we're excited to have you on to talk about your novel. It is a topic that I find incredibly interesting. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about you and how you came to write about the sexual adventures of an older woman? Yeah. Well, you know, when I look back on my career, which is fairly long, I realized I published my very first piece when I had the extraordinary good luck to get it published in the New York Times Arts and Leisure section, as it was known then. Wow. That was 50 years ago. Wow. So, yeah. I mean, I'm celebrating this 50 years of getting published. So that's great. But when I, most of my emphasis, and I think this was wrong looking back on my life. My emphasis was always on fiction. And whenever I had something to write that might have been a good essay and might have been published elsewhere, I had this like purity of vision that I only do fiction. I only create imaginative worlds. And I think that was a mistake because now that I've changed my attitude about that, I'm getting published in a lot of places. And it's really fun to find some small part of my life, like, I'll give you the latest example. Two or three weeks ago, I just on an impulse walked into a local salon and I got false eyelashes. Oh. Which are not on anymore, let me tell you, because you would have seen them. They were big. <laughs> <laughs> but out of that, I wrote a piece that's sort of funny and poignant about an older woman, you know, trying to look better. And I think that's a valuable thing. I think that's as valuable as my fiction, but I really didn't for most of my life. So I was writing fiction and most of it was about passion, about people who fall in love and the problems that happen and how they get back together or if they do at all. So that was from my very first book, which was an old friend from high school in which the protagonist, I think it's first person, yeah, uh, you know, to her great astonishment, she falls in love with a, an old friend who is a woman. And since she's had none of this experience, it's a kind of comic novel because like, huh, me? Why? How? And uh, had fun writing it. But this has persisted. And my short story collection was called Skin because it's really about skin to skin and short stories about that. And this was a great moment in my life because my literary idol, John Updike, gave me a blurb for the book. So uh, that was, you know, whoa. Yes, that yeah, is that so was cool. Really, really thrilling. I am also a aspiring author, so it or writer, I should say. So it it hearing you talk about these moments gives me a little bit of thrill. Just getting published in such a prestigious magazine is incredible or publication is incredible. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, that was, I mean, imagine coming out, you know, as your first published piece in, in a place like the times but you know <laughs> it didn't like really auger much in other words since then i've been clawing and scratching to achieve that early success and as i'm sure yeah. most authors will tell you particularly if they're about my age it's just getting harder and harder with yeah. more and more demands being made and there really are opportunities to in other words in the past there really wasn't an opportunity to self-publish in a meaningful way, in an inexpensive way, and in a way your work might be actually known. And there are authors who are genre authors, romance authors, who do extremely well. They'll, pub they'll sell three or 400,000 copies of a self-published book. And because it's self-published, they're getting a much greater cut. They might be making a million dollars a book. Wow. And yet, 
people who are not in a genre might never have heard of them. They're not going to get prestigious reviews, but they're making a great living. Right. Um, so, you know, even though opportunities for somebody like me, who's more of a literary writer, um, have narrowed, I think, opportunities in general have not. Um, so it, it's an interesting time, but it's a very difficult time. When did you turn the page and decide to start writing about pleasure and uh, sexual exploits of an of an older woman? And also, I'd like to talk a little bit about how you write about that, but we can do that in a minute. Yeah, it's not really that I turned the page. It's just that I became of an age where I was look, look, looking at life in a slightly different way. And then I realized that this was really interesting and this is so exciting because things are just starting to turn around. But when I look for, publishers will always say, you know, what are similars? What are books like yours that are not pretty well so that we can kind of compare it to? And interesting. I challenge both of you to find me a similar, to find me a book that focuses on an older woman. And by this, she's only 42 in the beginning, but she goes on carrying on until she's about 70, right? And I just wanted to put that out there because I just couldn't find any similars. And mm -hmm. I knew from the experience of people I know that passion and extra licit passion or illicit passion does not stop. It's not like, okay, you've hit 40 or 45. That's it. You're not going to have these crazy yearnings anymore. That's all over except your new strength as a crone or whatever. But I really did know people who, who were not at all like that. And I thought that literature, you know, has to accept all kinds of people and all kind. And I thought that this little thread of older woman passion had really never been woven into the grand tapestry of literature before. Now, that really was my basic feeling going into the publication of the book but shortly after the book was published a woman named a French woman French writer called Annie Ernaud won the Nobel Prize and what she is really known for is autobiographical fiction not that mine is but hers is um it's like her diaries get published and a lot of it is exactly about that a woman of 45 madly in love with a 30 year old and all she does to attract his attention and how her contact lens ends up on his penis. I mean, <laughs> this from the Nobel Prize winner. So I'm like, <laughs> all right, that is crazy. But it somehow made my book a little more legitimate. So I kind of thought with that going in, there would be a little bit more interest in it. But really, frankly, I was a little disappointed in the launch. Uh, it's not that people really said, oh, my God, here's something so new and so interesting. Right. Um, it was basically kind of ignored, but listen to this. Two days ago, you might have seen this. Two days ago, it was revealed that Gabriel Garcia Marquez's last unfinished book is going to be published. What is this book about? It's about a middle-aged woman who is married, but every year she visits her mother's grave on a different island. And every year when she's there, she takes a new lover. Wow. Marquez. Okay? Wow. How could you do better than that? So I'm really thrilled. I mean, you do need to feel that you are part of, you know, that you're legitimate, that your concerns are weird and off, you know, off the wall. So when I read that, I was really, really happy um, because, you know, if I were asked for similars today, what could I say? Annie Ernaud and Gabriel Garcia Marquez, partly, but, you know, um, it really is nice to find that this subject area has attracted major writers. Yeah, I agree. And I and we don't see it in movies. We don't see it in writing. We don't see people talking about it. It's almost a taboo subject. It really is. There have been a few movies. Nancy Meyer has made a few movies, uh, the starring Meryl Streep, or at least one, uh, I forget their titles, but they were five or six years old. So, you know, it's, yeah. it's there, but it's certainly very a, a minor strand. And I called the book Sybil Unbound because I kind of wanted the readers to maybe picture Sybil Shepherd, who's a very glamorous older actress, 
um, in this role. And so that if you could picture somebody who is appealing looking, it may make the whole subject matter more accessible, more easy to um, accept. And then it turned out, I read her autobiography, um, her memoir that was written by a Amy Lee Ball, who's a good, a good writer. And it, her book is called Sybil Disobedience. And it turns oh. out she is such a sexual libertine. I mean, was having affairs with two or three guys at a time. And, you know, really goes much further than my uh, heroine, who usually like, have, falls in love and then, you know, has an elaborate, you know, in involvement. And then usually I realize at the end of the chapter, something really bad usually happens to Sybil. I mean, it's not like it's all golden for her, something either a little humiliating or, or whatever, but she doesn't let it daunt her. You know, yeah. she goes on feeling passionate and in fact, act, acting out on her passions until the very last story, which takes place during the pandemic and which she is now sort of going to go into a new, um, a Zoom affair with an old <laughs> boyfriend, right? And he's yes. saying, like, take off, let me see what you're wearing and so on. So it, it was, you know, the pandemic brought a lot of new things for all of us. And for Sybil, this is, you know, what she's doing. Um, so I, I do think people are shocked at the notion of a 70 year old having sexual agency. Um, but again, I felt this was something that literature should represent and that I was in a good position to do it. So here I was doing it. Well, I like that you that you just told us about Sybil being the visual icon for your book, because one of the things that I thought was really interesting reading it was the descriptions of your Sybil, um, you know, how she still looked and was very vibrant and beautiful and as she aged and aged gracefully. And, but also when she described the men that she was involved with on a visual scope, some of the men were obviously aging and still visually viable in different ways. And I have found that in my own life when looking for men that I want to be in a romantic relationship with, they're not like the men of my twenties. Of course not. They're men who have aged and, and yeah. it's still beautiful. And it's yeah. still, I still find them sexy and desirable. And to actually say these words out loud, I think is very affirming for people because we all age. <laughs> Absolutely. And yet that core of passion doesn't always die down. I think it does for some people, but for some people it really doesn't. And they still want to be thrilled sexually and they're still looking for love. And um, I think that's, you know, that's brave and that's wonderful. I'm interested in what you said about my heroine, Sybil, because I don't think I actually ever describe her. Do I? You say she's still beautiful. And I think that's because of her attitude, because she never goes into a romance saying, oh, I hope he'll turn off the light so he won't see my sagging breast. There's none of that in this book. Yeah, no. But there's I, no, she looked yeah. in the mirror and she saw her smooth signing hair and her big eyes. I don't think there's any description of her. You just have to assume from her confidence that um, she's pretty Maybe looking that's for it. her age. But yeah. I don't think there's a single time maybe i at one point one guy says something like oh you got such a cute behind or something like that but i think you, you describe know. her hair a little bit though like you talk about her hair Do in I? some points don't you i i you have a maybe maybe you are a, seeing that oh, maybe we have a maybe visual that's because it. of the cover right I mean, that, that could is be. possible that could be i think so and that's good i wanted people to think of her as a great looking older woman, this is a stock photo that somebody found for the face. However, let me confess that the rest of the picture, as you, you know, there is a chapter called getting body painted or something. And yes. that is based on something that happened in real life. And so that fellow over there is my husband. And that woman over there is me, except for the face. So we we knew the body or, or we got to know the body artist and he came and he painted us. And when my publisher saw this picture in Huffington Post, he said, that's the cover. And I said, but not my face. Sorry. No. So <laughs> <laughs> because otherwise everyone thinks that really is me. It's not, of course. Right. So um, we found somebody, you know, we, we did a little Photoshop and that's fine. How was that to have your body painted with your with your husband? It was wonderful. 
it was wonderful. It was something, another thing we do together to have adventures. He's a, a younger guy. He's very adventuresome. He loves to do things. He he never says no, you know? So um, we've done hang glide. We've done interesting things together. Zip lining and scuba diving. And we did something called parasailing. I get confused. Mm. It's not the super dangerous one. But right. it's the one where there's a great sail in back of you. And mm -hmm. the instructor sits with you. And he, he adjusts the sail. And you're sailing like 2,000 feet over beautiful valleys against the cliff walls. And it's all because of one incredibly small sail that can be wrapped up and put in a backpack. Wow. Anyway, we did that scary thing and it wasn't scary and it was wonderful. But it's just like, it's great to have a partner who loves to do stuff like that. And he's keeping me young because he's he is somewhat younger. Yeah. Well, and I think it gives it gives women hope too, because there's so many signals and messages in our society that say after a certain age eh, you just die off you know just go off to pasture and don't be seen or heard from again and your book and you yourself are proving that no there's there's a whole lot left after a certain age in you fact, know life doesn't whole... stop desire doesn't stop love doesn't stop sex doesn't stop Thank Sex God. may change. I mean, I'm not the right. one to say that at 70, it's exactly the same as at 20. You of know, of course, of course, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot more going on, and you're more complex, and 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 you may be satisfied in ways you didn't think you could be. But the fact is, there's a strong sexual urge that can continue. Doesn't always, you know. I don't think most people really are. I used to think everybody was like me underneath. No, not really. They're not all. <laughs> but enough women do have strong libidos and more importantly, strong, sexy minds. Mm. Because as we know, you know, the greatest sexual organ is the brain. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm exploring that sort of thing in the book and hoping readers are going to read Sybil Unbound and say, wait a minute, I could do that. Or that reminds me of something that once happened to me and that will feel a kind of bond woman to woman now in the book you you do have a lot of sex scenes but they're not very explicit do you mm -hmm. have a reason for writing in that way yes because I myself don't like to see explicit sex I mean I've never understood pornography I really find it a turn off same um, just can't can't quite get why and so pornographic writing uh for instance, can I do this on, on your podcast? Can you can I do whatever worst? you want. Absolutely. Okay. So I would never write anything like, you know, he took off her underwear and he made himself hard and he put that hard penis into, because it's a turn off to me to read that kind of detail. Yeah. I don't think it's a turn off to men, but I think I probably am writing more for women because I am mm -hmm. a woman. Although I have to say men tend to like this book, I think a little more than women. I think women maybe are a little challenged by the book mm. and are putting up a resistance in one way or another. So there's that. But I like to get everyone really excited, or I'm hoping I am. I am as I'm writing it. And then to kind of leave them, you know. Afterwards, they decided, well, what do you mean? What do you mean afterwards? What happened? Well, you know what happened. So that's why I like to take people, I, I like to, I think I'm pretty explicit about kissing. Mm -hmm. Can I read you my kissing passage? Of yes. course. All right. Kissing is in a story or a chapter called mm, Here Comes Trouble is the chapter. Here comes trouble. Here comes trouble. So she takes one look at this guy and says, oh, no. <laughs> or, oh, yes, basically. Let me see. So I think this is as explicit as I get, but it's just a kiss. Mm. Well, I think it's good that you are explicit with the kissing scene mm -hmm. because so often kissing is seen and, you know, in real life, maybe just in my real life, but anyway, I've heard that other people experience this too, that kissing is seen as kind of like an afterthought or just a means to an end. Like mm. there's rarely the joy of just the kissing. I'm going to write about that in my next, uh, I have a sub stack called mm. Pleasure Principle. Mm. And I encourage your listeners to go have a look at it. So it's uh, Catherine Hiller dot substack 
www.pleasureprincipleshow.com. And then you'll find the pleasure principle, which is what I write once a week, little posts about pleasure. And I, I totally with you, Raquel, that there really aren't it, it's it's kissing is not just a way station in a hurry to get to the main station. Exactly. It's a place that you can linger and enjoy all by itself. Mm -hmm. And and yet not everybody feels that way. And I really do understand mm -hmm. that. Some men mm -hmm. are really not at all. They'll give you a perfunctory kiss. Mm -hmm. They'll end up being great lovers, but they just yeah. aren't into kissing. And maybe uh, they aren't great kissers. And just well, putting yeah. that out there. <laughs> maybe that's well, just been my had experience, had but practice or anything. Let me see. Oh, yes. All right. So on Monday, they haven't made love yet, her and Ben, but they've had this really strong flirtation. Okay. So on Monday, Ben came into the house and brought her straight to the living room couch. And there they kissed and held each other. Nothing more than that. But who would want anything more when kissing him was like entering a warm, moonlit lake? Was it only her feeling for him, smitten, that made their kissing rhapsodic? His mouth always knew what her mouth wanted most. Lip, tongue, pressure, softness, dryness, wetness, rhythm, rest. She pulled away to look into his eyes. Wow. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Um, and then at, at some point she asks, well, who taught you to kiss like that? And then he says to her, you did. Ooh, oh, that's sexy. Yeah. Isn't it? Isn't it? Because yeah. we feel empowered, you know, yeah. that we have just through our own reactions toward another human being, what we love. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, sex is certainly a means of communication. And I wanted that aspect of it to be there for these two lovers these two lovers are interesting lovers because when you get older, there are health problems that your lovers might encounter. And this mm -hmm. is a person, uh, her lover has had prostate cancer and has had the kind of surgery that makes it impossible for him to have an erection. And mm -hmm. yet she's absolutely madly in love with him. Mm -hmm. you know, she just can't get enough of him. She thinks of him all the time. So I think that's important. I think that's an important contribution to make that even though... <sighs> It's not heteronormative sex. Mm -hmm. It's still thrilling for both of them. Well, and it just opens up that, you know what, there's more to sex than just penetration. Absolutely. Absolutely. And for most women, you know, for many women, certainly many women mm -hmm. I know, penetration is actually maybe a not a very pleasant experience for them. They feel maybe mm -hmm. a lot of pressure to, you know, have orgasms that may be difficult for them with straight penetrative sex mm -hmm. and so on. So, you know, many women absolutely adore making love and so on. And well, I do too. But um, I also wanted to, you know, it's not always the only way to, to achieve your, your your most thrilling moments. That's all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it speaks of not just sex, romance. It speaks oh, of yes. Romance. Well, in intimacy. Yes. Yeah. And I think intimacy is is so sexy. I mean, when you feel you know someone inside out, you know what's going to please them. It's it's really, it's quite, quite wonderful. One of the parts of the book that was uncomfortable for me, I like to talk about uncomfortability. Sybil goes on to have extramarital affairs and she keeps those a secret. Mm -hmm. And then also talks a lot about being, she says, I think I'm really a polyamorous soul. And for me, the difference between polyamorous and then actually having an affair is quite big. Mm -hmm. And it did make me a little uncomfortable reading it, which I'm grateful for. I like that's to okay. Read it. And I remember you telling me this, and I'm awfully glad you brought it up because I do think yeah. it's a problem that some people have with the book. First of all, I try to lighten that problem by having her not actually be married, which might make a difference to some people. But yes. let's be honest here. She it is cheating. Okay. Yeah. She is not into the current wave of polyamory, which is le valid, legitimate, and so on. And, I and, and I know people are open people. about it. Absolutely. It's a big thing. Well, unfortunately, I'm a minority within a minority because if she had been, see, would the book have been different if she had been altogether all open with Quinn? Well, he would have had to have been a different person too. 
right uh, then it would have had to have been more about their relationship and their revealing it would have been a different book I'm just going to say Jennifer that for most of the world that I know about the women I know who've had extramarital liaisons have not been open okay they're yeah. not told and certainly say the French who have made you know all part of their national <laughs> um you know image is of that they do have affairs after marriage that they are quiet about it they do not reveal it but they do not particularly hide it in yeah. fact there are certain apartments that are called sank asset you know this right or maybe yeah. mm-hmm. my mm-hmm. book mm-hmm. but in yeah. any event special little love nests where the lovers can get along uh, uh, you know and be alone and then he will return to his proper wife who may have had a similar arrangement but they don't talk about it because actually it's kind of nice to have a little part of your life separate from your partner or your husband that's one thing and another thing it's just sort of built into the culture it is not built into American culture and no. I think my book is a hard read for people like that why doesn't she tell when why isn't she honest it just doesn't occur to her it's her thing she does it in private. She doesn't bring him anything less. She is a lovely partner to him and they are happy together. But this is their arrangement. And I just want to remind your listeners that this is the arrangement that has been in place for most of uh, the history of adultery, let's just say. Mm-hmm. And that polyamory is new and it's quite different. It and is. if I'd written a book about that, it would have been a somewhat different book. Mm-hmm. But it's an interesting thing to think of how different it would have been. Supposing he had said, fine, the you know, the Quinn person, go ahead and do it. How different would it have been? I don't know. Not yeah, that. it's definitely a different book for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It is interesting because I think it touches on a topic that Raquel and I talk about a lot on the podcast, which is the, sort of the good girl, obedient culture. I almost find it more uncomfortable that the woman is having the affair than the man is having the affair. And that's, I know that's my own bias. I know that comes from conditioning and, um, and I, that's what I love and appreciate about reading something, a book that's different is that it really makes me think about where does this come from? Why am I feeling this way about it? Why am I, why am I so much more comfortable if she had been polyamorous than if she had been adulterous. And I think it's a really important topic. Go ahead, Raquel. I, I do. Well, I I think, and this is just my thought on it, but I think the difference is as far as polyamory and that comparison is that generally in polyamory or polyamorous relationships, all of the partners know yeah, true. what's going on. And in this situation, Quinn didn't know. Or we're assuming that Quinn doesn't know, right? We're assuming because, that. Because part, you know? part, of, part of me thinks maybe Quinn knew, but maybe yeah. Does. Um, maybe he, maybe he does. That, that their bond is so strong that he can still be with this woman. And don't sure. forget, they aren't married. Sure. Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, but my, I wasn't more uncomfortable because it was a woman cheating. I would still be I would still be not I I wouldn't be cool with it even if it was the guy who was cheating right and you know whatever no judgment people make their own decisions do whatever you know do their own thing but what came up for me with this is that you can have a problematic character possibly doing you know problematic things and still get something out of the book Oh yeah. Being that women of a certain age and people as they age can still have sex and intimacy and desire and uh and and all of that and still be physically, you know, turned on by someone else. Mm-hmm. Or, or even by the or physically turned on by themselves, right? Because like we, like we were saying before, <laughs> yeah, because like we were saying before, our society throws people away after a certain age and they just sort of cease to exist as full actualized human beings. Well, I think 
that's true. And I was thinking, you know, a lot of people have asked me, like, why is it that there is so little representation of middle-aged and older sex? Mm -hmm. And I have to be honest here. I think there's a bit of an ick factor. And the ick factor is two things. One, any older person could be my mother, my yes. father. Oh, no, they're not supposed to feel this way. Mm -hmm. So there's that. And there's also the fact is that those who watch pornography, I have to only assume that mostly it's very young bodies. Because I, as I say, I, I really yeah. can't it, so I don't know. But yeah, I am sure maybe it's, it's very, it's very they probably specialized bodies. sites for, you know, older or whatever. But the idea is we think in our minds of these beautiful bodies, you know, you're going to see the muscle in his arms as he's pumping. You're going to see her lovely leg extending out, you know. So we like to think of that which is going on. And maybe in our minds, we are those wonderful, you know, gorgeous people. And that helps us go along in our sexuality. But um you know, that's not necessarily how we really are. I thought it was wonderful. Mona Simpson, when she, her book was reviewed last year, and she said she really wanted to see a representation in fiction of people who were in love with people who weren't beautiful. Yeah. And I thought there's a lot mm. of that in my book, particularly, mm. I think, the guy who, you know, the kissing guy who I just yeah. read about. Um, he's not a beautiful individual. And so, um, and she sometimes does fall in love with men who are not conventionally attractive. Yes, and, and of course, there's room for that. There's room for that in the world. Look at all the funny looking people who get married, have children, have great lives, and perhaps have great sex lives too. Yeah. But the E factor is really an important thing. And it was something I hope I overcame. But I just know that even in my own life, and speaking to people who are really you know, liberated, I happen to mention what is the truth that there is, there are a lot of um, SDTs going on in nursing homes. Mm -hmm. And the reaction to that was, oh, that's <laughs> you can't bear to think about that, right? And yeah. I don't think it's about the SDT. I think it's about the idea of old, frail people in their walkers having sex, you know, yeah. not a walker, but whatever, you know what I mean. I guess I'm, I just want to overcome that taboo. I've always been a kind of unconventional person and I'm usually reacting against some kind of stricture or law. Um, and this is one thing that led to my book, you know, just say yes, a marijuana memoir. Because at that point, which was at this point nine years ago, I wanted to take away the stigma from smoking pot. And to this day, there is so much stigma around it. I know so many people that leave their wine bottles out and hide their, you know, stash. Yep. Come on, folks. It's legal. You don't have to be so furtive about it, but they are. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm again, we've been programmed from a very young age. Uh, Raquel and I are the dare generation. We were taught, you know, in school yep. at a very young, we wore dare t-shirts around yep. saying, you know, just say no. I, I, yeah, I think it's a I think that is another tremendously interesting topic because we actually know that alcohol can be much more damaging than marijuana. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the health benefits have been often touted, but I just want to mention one thing that before, you know, while we're talking about that, which is yes, health benefits, but you are still bringing something into your lungs and maybe True. you should have a gummy. Well, yeah, that does make sense logically. But in terms of fact, when they were studying this and the NIH gave a grant to the researcher who was studying it, they pulled the money because they couldn't find it. In fact, these researchers seem to think that marijuana, and this is, they were straight researchers. I mean, you know, suit and tie people. It turned out that they thought that it actually might have a protective effect. So they didn't get any more funding. They couldn't go on with this, but maybe it's not so terrible to draw it into your lungs. I'm just throwing it out there. Well, the other thing too, because I have had this discussion with people about why why smoke when you could just take a gummy. Mm -hmm. Number one, a gummy takes longer to have any sort of effects. It can take quite a bit longer. But number two, isn't there something sort of ritualistic or community building about lighting a joint and smoking it within a group of people or by your, it's a different ritual than popping a gummy and perhaps the same reason why people like to uncork a bottle of wine 
and share it with a meal. Well, so, I really agree with you. And that was all thought. true before the pandemic. But I don't think people are going to be passing joints around anymore. I just think there's too much of an aware. Okay, you're looking skeptical, Raquel. Well, I'm, I don't know. I'm, I don't glad, know. I'm glad you, you and your friends are still passing it around. But, uh, <laughs> I think that there's going to be more hesitation. I used to be, you know, completely happy with, you know, even if a stranger came up, hey, I think I, one time it was during a concert and I went out in the middle of the concert to have a little smoke on, you know, East 79th Street, wherever I was in New York City. And uh, a guy came up to me and says, hey, you're smoking. I said, he said, can I have some? I said, well, I don't know you. He said, I've just performed. Don't you recognize me? <laughs> oh, okay, sure. And then back and forth. Germs didn't occur to me, but yeah. now it would. It just yeah. would. It's just a little different now. The pandemic has changed us all in many ways. And yes. that's one way I think so. But listen, I like to smoke pot because rather than eating it, because I know what I'm going to get. I, You know, when you eat... Mm. You might get nothing or you might get, a, you know, something that will leave you in well, shell shock. Like one of my friends 20 years ago, I never forgot. She just couldn't get off the couch. She hated it. She never smoked pot after that because she had eaten it. And, you know, there's a lot more that you can control when you smoke it. So, you know, I'm a smoking girl. Well, your book, it's called Marijuana Memoir. Just say yes. Well, it's called oh. Just Say Yes. That's how. It oh, is. it's called oh, Just Say Yes. It's called okay. Just Say Yes. What was the impact of writing that? Because I understand it was pretty impactful. Well, it was. It was. I look back with, you know, nostalgia because I was a, you know, a cannabis celebrity for three or four weeks. And it was really exciting. A lot of people <laughs> wanted to interview me. And I was so happy to be interviewed about pot. And, you know, it was a lovely little little thing that happened for a while. I could, you know, unlike every author, like, oh, if only I'd gotten more publicity. I got a ton of publicity. And guess what? I still didn't get many sales. So you, it's not always a direct, you know, I think that people got my message from the little bits in Vogue or Glamour or, you know, the online things that they they got the message and they didn't need to read the book or whatever. But I, I was surprised because you really think that these things go hand in hand and you get mm -hmm. a ton of publicity, you'll sell a ton of books, but it really didn't, didn't happen. But I was still very pleased. I mean, I've never had a reception like that. And it was really so much fun. And what was your message from that book? My message from that book is let's not demonize this wonderful plant that can make us feel better, that has health benefits, and that can make us feel closer to each other. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And what's your message from this book, Sybil Unbound? I would say be open to joy. And it oh. can come in different ways. And for Sybil, it comes sexually. She gets deep crushes and she needs, she passionately needs the physicality to, to get, you know, to, to, to fulfill her needs and to, to make this meaningful for her. I think that Sybil's attitudes are not widely shared. Yeah. I have to be mm -hmm. honest, but mm -hmm. are people interested in people who are not exactly like themselves or yeah. who are pushing the envelope in some mm -hmm. way? Yeah. And I thought that Sybil, being a woman who goes from the age of 42, thinking she's too old, to the age of 70, thinking she's not too old at all. And she's had this wonderful life, this passionate life. And why should she stop? Particularly because the research I began to do showed so much of what's going on is chemicals in the brain. We have these chemical precursors. And that when someone lights that fire, then these precursors mix themselves up and give you, you know, the, the most powerful physical responses. And in fact, Sybil, you know, has a response that's so big, she doesn't even recognize this as a sexual response. It's like, what is this that I'm feeling? And then, mm -hmm. and she's, oh yeah, maybe it's sex. But I do think that, you know, as I said before about how important the brain is, well, it turns out it's, this is, I'm not just, you know, it, it turns out that there's real chemical reasons. And there's a wonderful book called Wired for Love by a neuroscientist that was quite influential for me when I read it. It's a really great book. Oh, I'll read that. That sounds fantastic. Yeah. Wow. Well, I just, I, I really, you know, I've said it a couple of times already, but I think it's really important, Catherine, that you're writing about people 
having a healthy, vibrant, physical, emotional life after a certain age. And I think, I think part of why sometimes people are so afraid of getting older is because they feel like their life isn't going to have the same joys and pleasures that it did when they were younger. And this, this book and the way that you're writing about Sybil and, and her adventures shows that this doesn't have to stop. If you don't want these things to stop, they don't have to. Yeah, I'm glad I'm glad that message got across. And also, there's a, a woman who is writing uh, about older women and sexuality. And um, one of her books is called Women Who Want More. And then she's following it up with a book that has a rather dismal title, but it's actually a very interesting book, I think. It's called The Gray Affair. And in one of my... Uh, pleasure posts in the pleasure principle I write about it this is what I got out of that book that in some ways an affair when you're middle-aged is it's freer you're not looking to get married let's say you're not wondering about children or pregnancy it just exists on its own without being freighted by expectations so here's mm-hmm. another way to look at older people falling in love. It, it has a different quality because you're not basing the rest of your life on it. You're not scared to say, I love you, because what would happen if I love you when you're 25? You're thinking of like, will you marry me? Yes. But when you're 45 or 50, you could say, I love you and have not the slightest indication that you want to or are looking for a proposal. So yeah. that's the real difference. And that mm-hmm. can bring you, you know, a lot of joy in middle and old age. I also want to tell you that my my aunt, who was married for many, many years, she was finally a widow. She went to Florida at 78. She fell in love, deeply in love, sexually in love, more than she'd ever been in her life before. Right on. Wow. Good for her. Good for her. So I was thinking of her a little bit when I wrote certain passages I believed her. Some people will say, no, no, you're forgetting. I totally believed her. Why would she lie? And she was just having, you know, the deepest and most fulfilling relationship of her life when she was almost 80. Imagine that. Fantastic. There's hope for me. Yes, Raquel. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure you have a pretty good social life just looking at you. Come on. (laughs) Thank you. You're very kind. Thank you. I'm being very honest. (laughs) On your sub stack, you said you write pleasure principle. I might have this wrong, but did you have like a year commitment to write one article about pleasure a month or a week? A week. Okay. A week. Us- I came Tell- to the end of that year. Yes, it was, but I didn't sort of announce it to the readers. I only announced it when I went on hiatus briefly. So okay. I had a two month hiatus while I was doing other things, but I really surprised myself in the pleasure principle that every week I would have something to write about. It was a great challenge. And often on Monday, one of the disciplines, it really was like a practice, you know, people have practices. So my practice, it just involved a lot of people because I have, you know, subscribers. So my practice was at 11, 11, every Tuesday morning, you're going to get something. You're going to get something in your email box and it's going to be, maybe it'll be called the big O. And maybe it'll be called folding laundry, but it's going to be some aspect of pleasure. And you're going to be surprised and you're going to be pleased. And five minutes later, I hope your life will be a little richer because I make them short. I don't want people to save them up, you know, get it, read it, smile, go on with your day. I have found this has been a wonderful discipline for me. And it's also just been fun. I love it when I, somebody comments and Sometimes I don't know them and it's exciting to reach a, a stranger. So yeah, it, it's been actually good for me. And while I've been doing this, it hasn't really stopped my doing other sorts of writing. I'm working on another two books. I write short things for a publication called The Girlfriend. I don't know if some of you know mm-hmm. that. It's mm-hmm. an AARP yeah. newsletter for Gen mm-hmm. X. And then they have one older one called The Ethel for 60 plus. So I write for both of those. Um, these are short you know, usually short, they're like maybe twice as long as the pleasure principle posts, but they're on the short side and they can be, you know, a little superficial, but fun. My last one for the girlfriend was about false eyelashes. 
and you know the fun of wearing them but the, well, what happens when they start growing and getting clumpy and, and like whoa <laughs> <laughs> and, well, what do you mean I can't get them wet and how do I take them <laughs> you know so it was like a little exploration of that that's kind of fun and it's it balances my writing and I'm always drawn to topics that have not been written about before so my the book I'm really excited about turning to is and it's sort of in my mind and a lot of it's written but not a word on page Nonetheless, I know it's there. And it's a book called The Other Woman. And it's about another woman, the other woman in the marriage who basically wants to strengthen her lover's marriage because she doesn't want him free. She doesn't want him. She is <laughs> really happy with mm. what they have. I um, like that. that. Once every week or two relationship. And that's what she wants. And every time he says, I think I'm going to leave her. She says, well, have no. you tried have you tried buying her flowers? Have you tried dance lessons? And so she keeps making his marriage stronger because he keeps taking the, sometimes it doesn't work. And it, it's such a comic a aspect to it. So as you yeah. can tell, I mean, you all left, it is going to be a comic novel, but That's it's also, interesting. when have you ever heard from the other woman? She's always the villain. Yeah, mm. always the villain. And I think that what I'm seeing more and more of in the real world is these very complicated and beautiful relationships that include ex-spouses, children, ex-spouses that become friends, new spouses that become part of the family in a way that never really happened before. Mm. Yeah, so that's, sure. that's It's a beautiful thing to realize that Love doesn't have to be 100% exclusive and there's probably enough to go around. Yeah. And yeah. that it can change over yeah. time. It can change yeah. to suit. Yes. Here's an example of the my situation own love, is, uh, which mm -hmm. I don't, you know, haven't often given you, but, or maybe I have, I don't know. <laughs> I just have to talk about civil, but here is something safe enough to talk about that my first husband left me for another woman. Uh -huh. Luckily, I met you know, my now husband, uh, who I've been with for 31 years, so quickly afterwards that I really wasn't all that hurt, but I still didn't have fond feelings toward her. Why, of why would of I? course, of course. We upended our marriage. I have three children. I have to go to work. It was a complete change. Well, all these years later, I feel a strange bond with her. And the few times, you know, when we get together for family functions or one thing or another, we actually hit it off really well. We power up <laughs> together. Wow. And people seem a little shocked at seeing the two of us giggling, right? I mean, come on. And yet, so all these years later, things have worked out well for both of us. You know, that's And we're all just human people muddling through that's the right. world. That's right. Do the best we can. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was there anything else you wanted to tell our audience? I would just say, keep yourself open to joy. Whatever it may be, it could be that you once had a walk with someone and it was so wonderful, but you're kind of frightened to call her again and suggest do it again. Do it again. Give that call. Overcome your hesitancy. If you love flowers, make it a priority for yourself. You will always have flowers in your house, be they from Trader Joe's or going to a florist and picking out three roses and only three. I would say that it's really important to indulge yourself in ways that make yourself and uh, yourself happy because when you are happy, you are a better partner, you're a better love mother, you're a better lover, you're a better worker. Mm -hmm. Whatever you do, if you have enough joy in your life, it will come out. And so I would say, you know, give yourself over to joy. Beautiful That's message. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, lovely. Thank you so much, Catherine. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Let's do a recap, Raquel. Awesome. <laughs> well, as I'm sure people saw who watched this on, on YouTube, there was a lot of me going in and out because I was having technical trouble. But the part of the conversation that I was actually there for, like I said, I mean, I just, I just think it's so great that we aren't being forgotten, right? Because we're, I mean, I hate to say it, but we're at that age when women generally are not looked at anymore or are not considered sexual anymore, right? Um, well, where society says that <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> I'm not agreeing anymore because look, no, 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 I know, but, but, 
I think that's societally changing. and historically, at least I remember this. And I mean, uh, even I think it was like Tina Fey and Amy Schumer and a bunch of other women did a um, a video about um, uh, now you're unfuckable. Oh, right. Did, did yeah. you ever see that? I think so. Yeah. So it's that whole thing of, you know, you kind of you're only seen as like the grandma or you're only seen as the the little old lady. But yeah, Catherine is putting forth, hey, uh, uh-uh, there's so much more to it. And she's putting it out there in a big way. And Sybil is definitely a sexual and sensual being, which I think is is key. And, and- and I think there's more to it than that, but I agree with you there. Sybil is sexual. She is sensual. She's also very cerebral. She wants to like have different types of adventures. Like when mm-hmm. she goes to the, oh, I forget what they call it. Wild man, uh, fireman, fire. Oh, uh, 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 burning man. Burning man. Thank you. Burning man, yeah. I, I can never come up with the words you always do. <laughs> when she goes to burning man as a, as an older person and just to experience what that would be like that Mm -hmm. and maybe try a little, I don't know if she was doing psilocybin or something like that, but Mm -hmm. to experience a little bit of life or her interest with many of the men that she had affairs were, were based off things they were interested in things Mm -hmm. they were studying. I don't remember if it was art or literature or whatever, but the conversations were good. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, for a lot of, for me, that has a lot to do with romance is when I connect with somebody on something that we both find fascinating. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that I think is, I really, really loved about the book, probably the part I loved the most was when Sybil went with her, with Quinn Mm -hmm. to do the Kundalini, was it Kundalini Uh, Rising? uh, Yeah. yeah, Tantric. Tantric. Mm -hmm. They did the tantric stuff Mm -hmm. and almost the whole workshop was about making eye contact with other people. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about this myself because they called them lovers. You would turn to your next lover and you would make eye contact. Catherine described this in the book as Sybil's turning to each person and they're making eye contact with a lover. It could be a man. It could be a woman. It could be someone older. It could be someone younger. And several times what that person looked like really had no uh, no real bearing. Obviously she noted it, but then she got caught into their eyes and mm-hmm. more of like, who was this person truly? And there was sort of a love connection between every single person. Mm-hmm. So love and connection and all that, not necessarily sexual, mm-hmm. which I think is, I thought that was a really interesting aspect of the book. In some ways it seemed to me like, Yes, Sybil was sexually liberated, but really she was adventuresome. Mm -hmm. She wanted to Mm -hmm. experience life. And I feel that way. I feel like, okay, what am I now? 55? How many years left do I have to shove in all the stuff that I want to try and do before the end? Because the other thing we never talk about is death. We all know we're dying. It's looming out there. Let's not have it be looming. Let's know it's coming. And how do I choose to spend my precious time? And I think her pursuit of joy, pursuit of what is it that brings, this is a precious life. What Mm -hmm. is it that brings me, let's pursue joy. Let's go towards pleasure. Let's, Let's move towards those things that enhance our lives because they are so very precious. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm done on my soapbox. It's your turn. No, no, I think, no, that, that was lovely. That was quite lovely. There's no need to apologize for that at all. Um, Maybe it's because I just had this surgery to my face. I'm having this new, let's get out there and experience life because we never know. I thought I was going to have this tiny little thing done to my face and it's big. It was big. I went under general anesthesia and my thought was, I knew I wasn't going to die, but I was like, people do die under anesthesia. It could happen, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. and our life is precious. We don't know. We don't know. Yeah. Seek yeah. joy. That's, that is 100% good advice. And, you know, honestly, I mean, we all could seek more joy. I know, I know I could, there's opportunities that I should take and opportunities I can just make. And I need to do more of that. That's one thing that, that 
this whole conversation is making me realize is that I need to have some sex. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. But it also makes me realize that, you know, I'm a little bit of a chicken shit about it. You know what I mean? And I just have to, I I need to be nice to Raquel first and well, foremost. Well, yes, yes. I could have said that in a much nicer way. Yes. I need to be more adventurous and I need to, I need to broaden the ways that I pursue joy. I don't think you need to if you want to I do want to I do yeah. want absolutely so I just need to you know need to get off my get off my took us and go do it do it baby go do yeah. it yeah be like Sybil and go do it or go whatever, do it whatever it is your heart desires yeah yeah and you know I, I'll admit there's a there's there's some fear there but you know just have to push through it the fear's not going to kill me I won't or die from fear I'll be fine. I just need to push through it. Yeah. yeah, I really enjoyed this conversation today. It was good. It was good. Thanks, Raquel. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks, everyone, for listening today. We will be back with more Madness Cafe next week. You can find us on Instagram at Madness Cafe Podcast or email us at Podcast at gmail.com. Bye.